Hey guys, Dr. Ken Norberg, glad to see you again. I'm starting a special series right now uh, about whitetail feeding areas. There's a lot to know about them. And because of that, I'm going to break this up into several pieces. So this is part one about whitetail feeding areas. Uh, <clears throat> with the exception of the two to three week period before the primary breeding phase of the whitetail rut begins when antlered bucks are making ground scrapes. Whitetail feeding areas are the most productive of all stand sites during the hunting season. Well, people might argue about that, but after we've gone through this, this will give you something to think about <laughs> and, uh, and maybe improve your whitetail hunting because of it. Now, there are quite a few different kinds of foods that whitetails eat. And uh, I'm going to start with, with uh, acorns. And the reason is, uh, two of my sons, Ken and Dave, recently returned home from scouting and, and with a, a complaint. <laughs> Early scouting can be like that. You know, this time of the year, this is uh, the latter part of, uh, of, of September, uh, trees are all full of leaves yet, the grasses are growing. We've had so much rain this summer in Minnesota that uh, ordinary grasses in our hunting area that are maybe two or three feet tall are now five, six feet tall. Really crazy this year. Uh, but because of that, it's hard to find deer signs in the woods when scouting. And of course, this kind of early scouting depends on deer signs, what you find and what those deer signs tell you. Uh, whitetails can walk all over the woods this time of the year and you can hardly find a track except maybe on bare earth or mud, but well, through most of the woods, even on most traveled deer trails, the ground is covered with foliage. Uh, uh, there aren't any fallen leaves yet, but lots of green foliage and you just hardly ever see a definitive track while scouting this time of the year. There are, there's one kind of a sign though, no matter what, uh, that you'll always find any time of the year, and one of them right now is deer droppings. We'll be getting to that in another, in another uh, presentation. But anyway, the boys were saying, this year we have a bumper crop of acorns. And that doesn't happen often. The primary oak tree that we have in our hunting area is red oak. Red oaks, they can get to be sizable trees, but most of the red oaks we see up there are kind of scrubby little trees, maybe 10 feet tall. Some of them have gotten to be 20, 30 feet tall. And uh, the acorns aren't very large, they're kind of small, but wherever whitetails live, they love acorns. Uh, I remember spending some time down in South Carolina in the Orangeburg area and there were some little bushes maybe three feet tall, three feet wide and a lot of branches, a lot of twigs and had little tiny black acorns on them and I remember finding when I was there there were tracks all around those little bushes, those whitetails there loved those little black acorns. Well there are acorns as big as golf balls and uh, but our red oak acorns, they're not even the size of a marble. They're a little bit smaller than a, than a marble. <laughs> and anyway, uh, but when we have a bumper crop, that can play an enormous role in our hunting success. But the boys are saying the only place they found any kind of tracks and droppings was in, in groves of red oak acorns. And uh, so obviously the deer up in our hunting area right now are gorging themselves on red oak acorns. Now I can remember in years past, like uh, my son Ken had a spot uh, where he kept, where he would put tree stands, uh, uh, portables up in trees adjacent to this rather large grove of red oak acorns. And he took nice bucks, a couple of them are on the wall right now, uh, 
five years in a row on opening weekend, usually opening day, at that spot. And that was one of those years where we had a bumper crop of red oak acorns. Now, from what they had to say, that's going to be the place to hunt this year. But, you know, the weather's been crazy. In the last 12 or more years, we've had a lot of unusually warm Octobers and Novembers. And no snow on opening weekend. <clears throat> we've had seasons there was no snow for almost two weeks during our November firearm hunting seasons, which is kind of unusual. There were other years when we had as much as hip deep snow up there. But because of the weather, <clears throat> uh, either we'll have no snow <laughs> opening weekend, which starts later this year, November 9th, no snow on the ground, in which case red oak acorns are going to be our number one areas, you know, red oak groves of red oaks are going to be our number one stand site for sure. Even, you know, a month from now, they'll still be gorging on red oak acorns. But <clears throat> if we have snow, and we can have variable amounts of snow, but if we got six inches or more on the ground, forget red oak acorns. Uh, Whitetails will dig for them if the snow is shallow, two or three inches maybe. They'll, you'll find places where they've been pawing the ground to get to find acorns. Uh, but when you got six or more inches of snow on the ground, forget acorns. From that time, from the 8th of November on, which is a normal date for our whitetails to begin eating browse, uh, woody stems of various plants. Some of them are, oh, one of their favorites is what's called red, red osiers, or another name for them are red bark dogwoods. They love those. That, that's 85% of their winter diet in my hunting area. Uh, there's another one, uh, mountain maples. Uh, most of them only get to be about this tall, although they can grow to be 20 feet tall eventually. But whitetails love them so much that those plants get chewed down every winter, so they have to practically start from the ground all over again every spring. So they never get to be much taller than this, and they're all kind of crooked and and. Uh, when you're when you're used to looking for such things, uh, when we spot uh, uh, patches of mountain maples, they gray bark and the, and the, their stems are all crooked and little and and the tops are all chewed off. They're ragged brown or black tips on them at this time of the year. Uh, we know this is going to be a place to keep an eye on once the whitetails start. They turn to browse beginning November eighth, almost overnight. Kind of amazing. It's like whitetails have a calendar and say, oh, it's time to eat browse. And they just make that switch. Uh, uh, so many years that we've been hunting, we go out there on the 7th, and there's no sign of browsing anywhere. And the next day you go out there, there's white tips on browse plants where whitetails have been biting off those, those, those thin branches of browse them. Another real favorite in our area, we've had some Rather, we have some rather large clear cuts. They're getting old now. They're getting all grown up. But there's a lot of stumps, maple, uh, sugar maple stumps out there, and they get bristling with new suckers coming up from from the stumps, and uh, and they get to be rather tall too. But whitetails love those red suckers coming from sugar maple stumps uh, in these clear cuts. So that gets to be a real favorite of theirs as well. But those are browse plants, they're woody stems, and they'll eat those until they migrate to their wintering areas. And I won't tell you, talk about what to eat there. Well, I'll just mention, uh, at least half of our whitetails migrate to a lakeshore that's ringed with white cedars. And boy, during the winter, those whitetails around that lake, they almost live exclusively on the greenery of white cedar trees. and uh, But we have no white cedar trees in the 10 square mile area where we hunt and where I study whitetails. But anyway, those are browse plants, so that's another kind of, of, of food that they're going to be eating. But between now and the 8th, they're going to be still eating grays or green grasses and, uh, and other green uh, stem plants. Uh, you know, annuals that come up every year. And our whitetails prefer 
thin bladed grasses. You know, we have another kind there because they grow in little clumps and the, and the grass blades are a half inch wide and for some reason or another, whitetails don't care to eat those. Maybe they're too coarse or too stringy or something. But what like they like the little thin bladed bladed grasses like you find in your lawn. That's what they're looking for. Well, up there where we have all these clear cuts, uh, like I say, they've grown up pretty good, but what Mother Nature has done is divide these big clear cuts. Some of them are 40 to 80 acre, uh, acres in size. Uh, they divided it into different kinds of areas. In one place, we'll have openings. And, we're, and hardly any trees, you know, sparse trees in the openings where sunlight can reach the ground and, and, and bathe these grasses and other green plants, green leaf plants that grow in the area that white whitetails like to feed on. So we call those graze areas, full of greens. And then we'll have patches of those in some of these big clear cuts. And they're kind of open, like I say. And then there's other areas where the browse plants live. Now, those will be, they won't be quite as open. You'll have up bigger trees growing in there, here and there. But still, you know, because these plants that whitetails like to feed on can get to be six, ten feet tall if they're not chewed down every year by whitetails, uh, you can have a lot of deer out there when this gets to be as tall as they are nowadays, six feet tall, a lot of these plants. And without being able to see them until they're within 50 yards. But browse areas are kind of open, like graze areas, but uh, uh, they have a lot of woody shrubs and, and saplings growing in them, and uh, so they're not quite as open. But when we see a place like that, you're walking up close to it, and here it's kind of open here, and not a lot of big trees here, not no big shade producing trees, but it's got a lot of red stuff in it, <laughs> red stem shrubs out there. You know, we know right away, this has got to be a, a, a browse area come November 8th. From that time on, there are going to be deer feeding in this browse area. Now, there's other, other areas that, it was, so we have, these clear cuts have got browse areas here and there. In some cases, there's green grasses and browse growing in the same place, so they might be feeding there all the way from, from you know, spring until the end of November. <laughs> but, from, but usually they're kind of separate. And uh, because of that, we, when we're scouting, we have, to, we have to look for at least two, well, I've talked about three kinds of feeding areas now. So anyway, we, we got areas where there's acorns, areas where there's grays, areas where there's browse. So lots of different kinds. Gets to be even a little more complicated. Now, there are also lots of areas in these big clear cuts where there's no food at all. Or they, some of them are filled with raspberry plants, wild raspberries and ferns, sweet ferns, <laughs> uh, quite a number of plants. But they're important too to the whitetails. These grown up areas that are full of evergreens like uh, black spruces that get to be just thick, where you can hardly see 20, 30 yards in any direction there. Those are usually places for white tails like to bed. Not, not uh, the older bucks especially, they like wooded areas in which to bed. Uh, does and their young, they like places where there's grasses, like, like those browse areas where you, there are trees here and there, uh, but they, they can lay down those grasses and, and rest in there and be, be completely uh, camouflaged. Can't be seen unless you're practically on top of them. Yet most years, a little different this year because those grasses are so tall. But most years, when they, when they hear something, they can raise their head and peek through the top part of the grasses and look in all directions uh, to see what's happening. Uh, really safe places for a whitetail. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. Uh, of places where whitetails have been bedding. You can see the beds, you can see us measuring beds, you can see the grasses, you can see them in mixed timber, where right here's some whitetails laying uh, in grasses, but a lot of these shorter uh, shrub-like bushes growing between the camera and where, where, uh, and where they're laying down, 
Those are real typical for doe bedding areas. Bucks sometimes bed in those as well, you know, they can get out. I remember back when those clear cuts were younger, and uh, there were places, on one, one big clear cut I know, where bucks commonly bedded right out in the middle of the clear cut in deep grasses. Yeah, big beds, uh, 50 to 56 inches in length, and uh, out in the middle, you know, and, you, and a hunter walks up to there and you think, oh, you know, there's woods all the way around the clear cut, and you wouldn't think that there could be bucks laying right in the middle of that clear cut like they, well, like they did, but that often happened. And uh, my, my boys and I have taken several bucks in that particular clear cut that were doing that one way or another while well, stand hunting. Uh, we never made drives or, or still hunted in places like that. But anyway, so now we have all these separate areas, uh, groves or patches or stands of timber. Now in some places we've got old stands of, of uh, uh, red oaks, you know, big trees, and underneath it in the summer it's kind of shady under there, and those big trees are, they when they have a bumper crop of acorns, there are a lot of acorns out in this area, and this one the area I'm thinking about is about six, seven acres in size, and there's all these trees, and the trunks, some of them are maybe a foot in diameter, and the branches on them six inches in diameter. And you walk out into that into that grove, and it looks like a war zone, because bears <laughs> also like red oak acorns, and they want them while they're still green, uh, which is easier to chew, I suppose. I don't know, but you go, you walk out there, and you see these these trees, these older trees with branches busted off, lower branches, and sagging to the ground around the trees. This is a feeding area. You see the leaves on the ground there? Those, they're red oak leaves. And this thing, this little stand of red oak that goes around just a small area here. It circles around, goes back that way a little bit. Uh, drops a lot of little marble sized acorns in the fall. And I've run into white tails here in the fall many times feeding along this little ridge in these acorns. So one of the things we have to do here, I've never hunted this feeding area, but one of my aims this fall is to figure out where, where, some, where I want to be sitting here. Uh, right here is east and west. We're looking east and west. And uh, so you sure don't want to be sitting on the west end in a normal west wind. Probably could come in from that way and stay back a little bit and sit right there along that trail and watch this section of the feeding area. But there's always lots of deer tracks and dropping along this stretch here in the fall after the, these little trees start dropping their acorn. This is about as big as our red oaks get up here in this north country. They're kind of scrubby. Here I don't see any evidence of bear. Uh, I'll show you places where we have red oaks and they, they busted all, down all the lower branches to get at the acorns while they were still green and clinging to the tree. It makes it easier for the bears to eat. Right there, I think so. Oh, you see one there? I think so. Okay. Looks like a three inch diameter branch busted off. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's typical when you see that. That's deer sign. Yeah. And they bust them. Well, let's take a look at that. Wherever there's oak that produce acorns, those broken branches, lower branches, that's bear sign. Mm -hmm. And a black bark on them. And if you get out there early, like in the latter part of August, and you and you go out there and you find freshly busted branches like that, you go over and check them out. You find bear droppings, uh, full of little pieces of shells from the red oak uh, acorns, and and occasionally where you have bear run, you find bear uh, tracks as well. But the bears, especially the bigger bears, they'll go out there, grab a whole one of those branches, and if it's a big 
bore and weighs 300 pounds or more and just crash. I'll break them down. And they just made a mess out of that place. But that's another kind of feeding area. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, I'll talk to you about all these feeding areas. Well, today let's talk about uh, oak, ash stands of oaks. And this is going to be pretty true all over America, wherever you hunt whitetails, whatever kind of acorns are out there. Now, like I said, there's been years when we've had bumper crops like this year, when uh, red oak acorns were the key to really great buck hunting. You know, we knew that those deer would be feeding even in November, if the ground was bare, on acorns. And so we made it a point to hunt near them. And we took a lot of bucks in places like that in years past because we did that. Now this year, we don't know. You know, starting November 9th, it could be we'll have lots of snow on the ground, and those won't mean a thing this year. It'll be back to the browse areas. But we have to prepare for everything that might happen. We don't know what's going to happen. But if the ground is bare opening weekend, boy, you can bet we'll be hunting where there are red oaks and lots of acorns on the ground. Now, <clears throat> well, there's a, a problem with, you know, if you got a, uh, a, an older clear cut and all the red oaks are little and they can get to be really thick out there, it's not as difficult to get close to that that's kind of an area without the whitetails out there seeing you. But, uh, so you can get, in fact, you can get right in amongst them if you want. But the problem is today, if I, I can think of one place that, uh, you know, I've got a stand called Lonesome Pine out there. In that particular clear cut, the red oaks, these younger red oaks, they're about 10 feet tall now and they're bushy. And, you know, red oaks hold their leaves all winter long. So. In November, that'll be all full of red leaves in there, <laughs> and these acorns. And uh, you can have a dozen whitetails feeding on acorns 50 yards away and not be able to see them in there. Well, they can't see you either. But that can be a problem because uh, this area is large, and uh, uh, you can sit out there all day and not see another whitetail, and there might be a dozen whitetails in there all day long, and you not be able to see them. Now, I got this other area I was talking about where all those big limbs are broken down. You can see it quite a ways underneath all those big trees. Way over there, oh, two blocks away, over that way, and maybe three blocks over that way, and a block this way. It's hard to get close to that spot, that stand of red oaks, without white tail seeing them. Now, the problem with oak trees or acorns is. White tails commonly bed amongst the acorns when they're when they're feeding on them. Uh, they don't do that with many foods when they're on browse where we hunt. Their beds can be quite a ways away. You know, our our does will have our does have home ranges average about 126 acres in size, and uh, their beds won't be that far away, but you know, several blocks away. Uh, our bucks, our big dominant bucks have uh, foam ranges that are one to two square miles in size, which means uh, they might be feeding in this stand of red oaks over here on one corner or, or one side of their home range, and but they might be bedding one to two miles away and travel a long way to get there. And the reason they're picking that spot is because the does, a doe in heat is, is feeding on those acorns, and so they want to be where that doe is, they, they smell it, they're looking for it, and they're spending their time with those in heat in November, during this primary breeding phase of the rut, when 85% of does are bred. Well, anyway, so, but the thing about red oak acorns, and I, you know, I learned this uh, while hunting in the Crex Meadow Wildlife uh, Management Area in Wisconsin, western Wisconsin, but bow hunting there, and uh, uh, there were so darn many deer bedding amongst those uh, those uh, mature oak trees, and so well hidden. You know, at that time of year, their 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 coats blend so well, and if there's little bushes and grasses growing underneath those those trees, 
you can't see them very well when they're bedded. Or if they're feeding there, you get there early in the morning in the dark and they're out there right now feeding. So we learned real quick. My, one of my cousins and, and a friend of mine and I, who used to go over there and hunt, uh, don't get too close to those stands of oak trees when, uh, when they're in these mature oaks. You're much better off hunting on trails that seem to be well used, especially trails with tracks of mature bucks in them, tracks that are at least three and a half to four inches long, just for hope only, in those trails. And droppings, uh, anywhere from three quarters, well, five eighths for a two and a half year old buck, uh, three quarters of an inch or more in length, uh, fresh, you know, shiny droppings in trails uh, that lead into this grove of trees. Because when they're in these relatively opening areas, you got to have good cover all the way to where you plan to sit. You know, you might have put up a, a tree stand the day before in a tree or a week before, two weeks before, of where you're planning to hunt there. Two weeks is better. Uh, but uh, you, if you can't get there without being seen and heard by a buck that's feeding on acorns in that, in that uh, grove, because it's kind of open underneath these big trees, you aren't going to have much luck there. So you're better off getting when they're coming and going from that, that place, that uh, stand of oaks. Now, when I say deer will commonly bed in there, most often the ones that bed there are does and they're young. Now, you might not care about those, but if you alarm any of those deer while sneaking into one of these stands of oaks, uh, not only are they uh, likely to make a lot of noise, uh, bounding, going away, and snorting as they go away, but in the process, their, uh, their partial glands will be emitting the ammonia-like uh, scent that, they, that those glands produce when they're in, uh, in a, uh, a, uh, when they're very alarmed. Uh, anytime a whitetail raises its tail and bounds or trots past, away, it's making a trail, oh, I don't know, several feet wide that, that uh, with the odor of this ammonia-like odor coming from their tarsal glands. And it's warning all deer downwind through this ever-enlarging triangular area downwind. There's something really dangerous over here. So there's three ways there warning other deer with the snorting and the sounds of bounding and this ammonia-like scent. Of drifting downwind from where they're going. Uh, so if you if you alarm other deer in the area and the buck is there with the doe, uh, you don't have any chance of taking that buck. So it doesn't matter. So you're better off hunting major deer tra trails that have been used a lot recently, fresh tracks and droppings in the trail that go toward that thing. Stay back as far as you have to uh, in, a, in order to use cover between you and that stand of, of red oaks or whatever kind of oaks there so that you can get to your stand site without being seen. You don't want to be seen. And uh, before the season, if you kind of clean all the dead branches out of that trail, last 100 yards, 200 yards, uh, leading to your stand site so you can walk softly getting there, and you're, you're keeping it well away so they can't see you, your odds will be much better there. Even though they might use other trails that day, uh, the odds are that they're going to come be back there again the next day because you didn't alarm any deer in that stand and get into your stand site. So your odds are pretty good the next day on a, in a situation like that because you don't get too close. But that was the only way uh, over there at the Crex Wildlife Management Area that my buddies and I could take bucks um, during, that, during the archery season in Wisconsin. So um, it just doesn't pay to get too close to those stands of older acorn trees or whatever kind of acorn trees you have in your area. Don't get too close. Just hunt trails leading to that area. Now, in the case, like I was telling you about, where you have a lot of younger trees, and it's really thick, you can get a lot closer. But pick your spot and make sure you always approach 
from downwind or crosswind to get to that spot. And, and you want to be able to do it silently. This section of it's here, there, but there's always lots of ear tracks and dropping along this stretch here. Wherever there's oak. And from downwind or crosswind and without being seen. And you might, your odds of seeing deer in a large area of young red oaks might be terrific, might not be terrific on any one, any one day because they're so hard to see until they're real close. Uh, but there again, if you didn't alarm anything getting to that stand site one day, uh, later in the day your odds might be good that evening. Maybe they'll be feeding in a little different area or the next morning a little different area again and you'll finally have some deer up close. So, but don't count it an after that. But at least three feeding periods in a row, your odds will be pretty good in, under circumstances like that. So, those are things to think about when you're hunting uh, whitetails uh, on, that are feeding on acorns. Uh, they bed there a lot of the time. You know, they'll bed there, some deer will bed in a a stand of oaks that where the acorns are raining down for two, three weeks. Bull hunters run into this problem all the time. Gee, they were out there scouting a little early before the scene, on all kinds of sign in one place. Oh boy, this is the place to hunt. And then get out there and see nothing because those deer are feeding on acorns over there somewhere. And they're not in this other area. They're all in that area. Probably the best time to hunt whitetails that are feeding our acorns is during, in, is in September, during archery season. Um, by the time you get to the uh, gun hunting season in November, uh, they can still, those, those kind of areas can still be good as long as the ground is bare. The whitetails can find acorns there. Your odds are still better there than almost anywhere else. But um, anyway, that's what you need to know about hunting uh, uh, whitetails feeding on acorns. So if, if that's in your plans this year, keep all this advice in mind. See you again soon. Oh, and be sure, you know, uh, be sure to subscribe. You know, uh, being able to present hunting seminars on the internet uh, is, is quite a privilege, you know. Uh, not everybody gets to do this, and uh, I owe my chance to do this to guys like you, especially you guys who subscribe to my YouTube channel, because the more I get, uh, the more <laughs> YouTube and, and uh, Google uh, likes me, you know, they, Google's paying me to do this, but in order to continue doing this, I have to keep growing on this. I need more and more guys signing up and I wish you'd do that. And I have a lot more to teach, you know, no end to it. So with that, be sure to subscribe and, and I thank you for that. And also, uh, uh, you know, see that little thumbs up button down there? That helps too. And keep this in mind too, you know. Everything I teach on YouTube, this is a little short seminar. This book, my latest uh, White Tail Hunter's Almanac, my 10th edition, took three years to complete because there was 20 years of new uh, research that went into White Tail Research with wild deer that went into it. So what I've taught you today is a little bit of time on one subject. This covers everything in great detail on a huge number of subjects. So it's a book you're going to want. You, you, you're just going to want this book. If you wait and wait and wait, someday when you do get it, if I'm still alive, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll wish you had gotten it a lot sooner because it's so filled with good tips and instructions for hunting older bucks. And uh, so, anyway, keep that in mind too. <laughs> so thanks a lot guys for watching and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.